Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 26th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and our new Substack page. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss Senator Hoffman's hint about where the legislature's fiscal policy working group may be headed, as well as the comments we intend to file. Second, we make our point about Governor Dunleavy's absent fiscal policy in graphic form. And third, good news, bad news from the North Slope. Hillcorp is drilling again in Prudhoe, but the PICA project is in flux. And now, let's join Michael. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into it here, Brad, and start things off with the special session, the working group, and Senator Hoffman may be giving us an indication of which way we're going on this. Yeah, last Thursday. So, so there's a good article in the uh, Alaska Public Media uh, website. Uh, the title of it is "Ahead of Special Session, Alaska Mo- uh, Lawmakers Consider Phasing in PFD Changes Along with New Revenue." It's an article by uh, Andrew Kitchenman. Um, And what that picks up on is were some brief comments uh, only by uh, uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, the co-chair of the committee, uh, at the close of last Thursday's um, uh, session of the working group. But it was it's about the only time that there's been a discussion by anybody in the working group really about how um, how to deal with uh, the, the total uh, the, the comprehensive solution to the uh, to the to the fiscal um, situation that we find ourselves in, and Senator Hoffman's comments at the end of Thursday's session uh, were focused on a way to phase in, in his view, a way to phase in uh, getting to uh, a, a 50-50 PM, uh, POM, 50-50 PFD. Um, that he was, you know, said, let's assume for the moment that we're, that that's, you know, the target that we're going to go at. How do we get there? And, and if you go to a 50-50 POMV, uh, you need substitute revenues to take the place of PFD cuts uh, uh, to, to, you know, have a balanced budget to support, to provide the revenue to, to get there. Um, because, and, because heretofore uh, they've been cutting the dividends to fill that revenue right. just for people who aren't paying attention. Right. And so and so you need substitute revenue to 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 handle that. And Senator Hoffman suggested that if there were if there was substitute revenue, if the goal was to get to a 50 50 POMV and there was going to be substitute revenue, that that would phase in over time. You just can't say, you know, tomorrow, say we're going to have a a sales tax or 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 some form of of alternative revenue and plop. It'll be there. It takes it. it, You have to set up the mechanism and and uh, and and put it in place not to mention passing the statute. Um, and so the, the question was, how do you, the question in Senator Hoffman's mind was, how do you get there? And his approach was to, uh, was to phase, it, phase in the PFD, the, restoring the PFD to POMV 5050 uh, as the revenues come in. So the first half year you would get some revenues, you would restore a little bit of the POMV or the PFD. Next year you get a full year of revenues, you would restore the, more of the of the PFD and ultimately get back to a 50-50 POM, uh, POMV PF, uh, PFD. His starting point, <laughs> this is what captured my attention and some other people's attention, his starting point was $500, $500 yeah. <laughs> PFD, which happens happens to be the leftover PFD uh, or, the, <sighs> or the, 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 the leftover dividend that, uh, that Senator Von Imhoff and, and others have been talking about. 
The alternative to this, and it wasn't put, nobody put it on the record, but the alternative to this is, is something that has been surfaced uh, before, not at the committee, but been surfaced before, which is to use a, a, a portion of the earnings reserve as that alternative revenue, substitute revenue, while you're uh, while you're phasing in uh, right. uh, the alternative revenue as a bridge, so, right? As a bridge uh, to get you right. there, right? Right, and that's been that's that was that's essentially the governor's proposal. It's been a proposal that uh, that others have talked about. Uh, I've talked about it here, uh, essentially as a loan, as as we would borrow from the from the earnings reserve, but we would have to pay it back uh, uh, over time as we have to pay back the CBR over time. Right. Um, but use it as a loan to, to bridge in. So that's that's the alternative. That nobody mentioned that. Uh, I think Senator Hoffman took people by surprise by talking about that at the end of the session. I doubt if anybody at the end of the hearing, I doubt if anybody else was uh, was prepared to uh, deal with it. But um, that that's sort of the alternative. So so he has laid out one alternative, which is to bring to, which is to raise the PFD as you bring in these these uh, alternative revenues. Uh, I think the other one out there is to use the uh, use a portion of the ERA as a bridge as you bring up these other revenues, uh, and and you would use the ERA in a way to to provide the substitute revenue so you could have a full 50/50 uh, POMV from uh, from the beginning, um, and that's and that's and that's basically you know really the only discussion uh, that's happened thus far in the working group about. Uh, about a proposal about uh, 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 to to come forward to the legislative session, which now starts in, you know, just a few days. So right. it, it was jumped on by a lot of people as a as as a as some as having some meaning in terms of uh, where the working group may be heading. Right. Well, we talked about this yesterday. I mean, the session, the special session, is supposed to start this coming Monday. So we're literally less than a week away from this, and the working group really has nothing at this point. I mean, there's no real recommendations. Uh, they, you know, they still, they still have been finding their footing. And, uh, I mean, I questioned as to whether or not they would even be ready for the special session. If it was to start on this coming Monday, uh, they don't really have anything uh, put together yet. So what do you think are the chances that the governor, uh, which has been proposed and, and and suggested by several people, including Jeff Landfield and others, that the governor is already planning on uh, moving the date of the special session? And then look at that with, you know, the normal disbursement of the PFD in the first week of, sept of uh, October. We don't have a whole lot of time here. We don't. Uh, <clears throat> I don't. I don't know if the governor is going to move it. Uh, I'm not sure anybody knows you know, exactly where this thing is headed right now I, the the comprehensive working group has scheduled one of their another of their public hearings or at least a a, a session uh on august 2nd which is the starting day uh of the of the uh of the special session um and i think the the consensus is if the special session starts on august 2nd if it goes ahead and starts next monday that it would just be technical sessions while the comprehensive working group uh continues to work uh, continues to work toward a solution, and that uh, the real work of the special session would be uh, once the comprehensive working group uh, uh, finished. Um, and that means, you know, you, you, the special session is for 30 days, so that means that, you know, if the comprehensive working group took another two weeks, came up with recommendations, then there would still be two weeks left in the in the session. It is a very, very tight timeline um, that we're that we're working against, and you know, we can't we. We could move the special session. The governor could move the special session, uh, although he has to call it 30 days. I think he has to call it 30 days in advance. So that means he's sort of running out of time to get it called for September, uh, which is which is where some have, have suggested he would uh, he would move it to. Right. Um, but I, I'm not sure. You know, I don't think anybody's sure at, 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 a, at a minimum. We know, I think, that the comprehensive working group isn't or the working group's not going to have a recommendation for the start of the special session, um, even if the special session does start on August 2nd. Right. I think that's pretty obvious at this point as well. I, I want to say one thing that I've been hugely disappointed in about the comprehensive working group okay. and, and that that's going to be the focus of the, of the written comments I'm going to submit, uh, to the working group, uh, this week, there's been no discussion, uh, at all that I've seen, uh, uh, that the working group's undertaking of the distributional impact 
um, of of the various revenue options. They've talked about various revenue options. Yesterday, um, uh, Senator Showers' uh, uh, sales tax proposal and and rep- and Representative Will uh, Wool's um, proposed HB 37, which is a combination of a of a, a sort of flat tax and uh, and PFD cuts. Um, those were introduced and 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 some materials were distributed about them, but there was nothing in there about the distributional impact of either of those. And without the distributional impact, as we talked about last week on the show, without the distributional impact, you're flying blind. You don't know who's paying. Um, you don't know what what income bracket is paying uh, is taking the burden uh, of the of the fiscal solution. And frankly, you don't know the economic impact. Because, as, again, as we talked about on last week's show, the economic impact is driven a lot by the distributional impact. If you take, if you put the burden on middle and lower income uh, families, you have a much higher economic impact uh, uh, on, in terms of circulating money in the state, much higher economic impact than you do if the burden is spread uh, much more broadly across uh, all of the income brackets and the burden on the middle and lower income brackets is is lowered from where you are on PFD cuts. They've had no presentation uh, on on the distributional uh, effects of any of these revenue options, um, and I think that's just I, I think that's just hugely disappointing. I mean, right. for for a committee not to want to know who's going to pay um, uh, uh, the burden of any of, of any of these proposed fiscal solutions, uh, I think is just shooting in the dark. Donna Ardwin also says in the chat room they also need a pro-growth economic impact as well. Um, and, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot that they're missing here. Yeah, it's just it's it's been disappointing that they have not taken up um, the distributional analysis and, and spun and spun off the uh, the economic impact uh, analysis uh, uh, from that. So my comments are going to focus on going through the distributional analysis of the various options i've i've posted it i've posted sort of the outline of it uh, on facebook if uh, on the alaska for sustainable budgets uh, facebook page if people want to take a look at it but you can start with um the uh pfd cuts and look at the distributional impact of that and we and as we know from last week's show it's hugely tilted against middle and lower income Alaska families, then you can sort of layer on, layer on an income tax that some people, uh, uh, Representative Wool's HB 37 sort of says, well, we're going to offset this PFD impact with a, with a, a modified income tax. Um, and and that, doesn't, that doesn't even come close to offsetting the adverse impact of, uh, uh, of heavy PFD cuts. So you can sort of play with that a little bit, and then you can layer on a sales tax and see what that does. And then layer on a payroll tax, which we have some data for, uh, that 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 helps offset it, offset it. But at the end, even after even after you do all those, trying to get the distri- distributional impact even, you know, remotely uh, fair among among the income brackets, at the end, all you've done is you've layered on four taxes, four different types of taxes, uh, and you're and you're still not all the way there. You still have a a, a larger share of the burden. Uh, running against uh, uh, lower income, middle, lower middle, and lower income Alaska families as a result of that. So, at the end of at the end of my comments, I'm going to you know summarize by saying, look, you know, we're 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 going through all these circles just to try to, you know, even out uh, the impact across the income brackets. The best way to do it is just a flat tax uh, that does exactly that, evens out the burden uh, across the income brackets. And has a lower, much lower impact, adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy um, than any of the alternatives. I I hope uh, that that the committee uh, takes on the distributional issue uh, at some point. I think it's a huge failing distributional and economic impact issue at some point. I think it's a huge failing that they haven't done it yet. I'm disappointed that some of the members haven't. Uh, some of the members who should be focused on that haven't focused on that. Um, and um, and hopefully you know my comments will will distribute will 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 further that issue at least somewhat and get, and get some people curious about about talking about that further. But at, at this point, I, I think that the working group is just sort of uh, is letting itself fly blind 
on the uh, on the impact of the various revenue options that they're talking about. A couple people have mentioned, Brad, you know, Senator Shower gives us some good options with his sales tax, especially since they have a sunset clause built into him and all of his, I mean, he's got 12 different vari- variations of this plan, but they all pay off anywhere from two to eight, two to eight years, I think. Uh, and they've all got a sunset built into them, which I think is attractive to many people. What 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 say you about uh, those proposals? I, I think a sunset's fine uh, uh, with with any proposal. Um, I mean, the, the 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 challenge of a sunset is you've got to get spending down. Senator Showers, you know, payoff uh, uh, depends upon uh, huge spending cuts and depends upon the governor's proposed spending cuts, which are we'll talk about in a moment, which are huge, um, and depends upon you know, oil prices uh, uh, continuing out as the Department of Revenue is forecast, which the futures market, uh, we've talked about this on previous shows, the future futures market is indicating that oil prices are going the opposite direction uh, than uh, than DOR. And Senator Shower depends, and Senator Shower's proposal depends upon high returns, continued high returns from the, from the permanent fund uh, and on uh, substantial increases in oil production. Uh, all of which is speculative. So, I, I think it's okay to have uh, okay to have a sunset and force the legislature to address these issues uh, again. But you've got to understand that for that sunset to work, all of those all of those th- sunset to work in a way that you don't need additional revenues after that point. All of those things have to click. Oil prices have to stay elevated. Uh, oil production has to ramp up substantially. The permanent fund or earnings have to. Uh, uh, have to uh, uh, you know exceed expectations, uh, and uh, and there have to be substantial cuts along the way, and 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 to some degree, uh, the uh, uh, the sunset is saying, yeah, we're going to do all that, but but you, if you don't do it, you've got to have the expectation when you get to the end of the sunset, you're going to have to you're going to have to either extend it or you're going to have to do uh, do something else. The other thing I say, I'll say about Senator Shower's sales tax proposal is sales taxes are regressive. They're not as regressive as 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 PFD cuts, uh, but they're nonetheless regressive. They take less out of the top 20 percent than they do out of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's the same sort of backward sloping uh, uh, chart that you see with PFD cuts, just not as extreme uh, at the end. And the question is, do we want to have uh, a regressive tax in this state. I mean, do we want to have a tax that takes more out of middle and lower income Alaska families, has a larger adverse impact on the Alaska economy uh, than a than a flatter tax, a one that the one that uh, spreads the burden more broadly uh, and includes the top 20 percent? So, you know, I the 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 sunset portion of it that's fine, based upon a lot of assumptions that uh, that all have to click for it to for for it to actually sunset at the end of that time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, you know, do you want a sales tax? Is that, is that the, the way you want to structure the burden on the state? I will note the Senator, none of Senator Shower's materials, just like everything else, none of Senator Shower's materials, uh, have a distributional impact analysis with it. I mean, that's, that's standard procedure, uh, in the lower 48, it's standard procedure at the federal level. To have a distributional analysis, none of the stuff that anybody's proposing up here has it. The reason they don't include it, in my opinion, is because of what it would show. They know what it would show. They would know they would it would show that you're shoving cost of middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. So they just they just leave it out. Um, and so I, you know, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm just disappointed across the board on the failure to include these distributional analyses. But, you know, that includes Senator Shower's proposal of a, of a sales tax. Um, there was another – do I have enough time? Uh, let me tell you what was floated to me the other day. Uh, I was talking with some folks behind the scenes and some of the different uh, movers and shakers, and there was a discussion about uh, an SJR6 component where it was a modified SJR6 where not only did they include the PFD and the, and the uh, PCE in the uh, conversation – but they also would enshrine a portion of monies to be paid to the marine highway system uh, in that constitutional provision, and they thought that that might shore up some of the uh, some of the reticence on the behalf of some of the coastal communities, including Sitka and, and everybody else. What say you to that? Oh, it's now we're in the sausage making of uh, of getting something passed. I mean, the the key 
the key is getting the PFD protected, stopping this tax that burdens uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, stopping this tax that has the largest adverse impact. And if it takes something like the Marine Highway, then fine. And then fine. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it is. It's like sausage. It's like, what's the end goal? The end goal is to put the PFD out of reach and create a quasi-spending cap by taking that revenue out of their hands and put the ERA away. That's really what it's all about at this point. I found this proposal interesting um, because the, the, the main challenge with uh, the SGR 6 proposal is that it leaves some players out and they're not happy. You know, they're not happy with it. Um, but, of course, one of the hot-button issues for every coastal community is the marine highway system. And this idea that, like you said, the sausage-making, this is politics. You know, everybody's got to give, uh, you know, everybody's got to give a little to make everybody unhappy, essentially. That's the idea of compromise is that everybody walks away a little bit unhappy. Um, but this idea that they could fold the a marine highway disbursement into this thing, um, so that it would be uh, constitutionally protected and would have a set amount of money that gets dispersed to it every year, like the PCE. Um, I mean, this is going to raise some real red flags among many fiscal conservatives, but it might be the only way that something like this uh, SGR 6 actually gets passed with the ultimate goal of putting the ERA completely out of reach and constitutionalizing the PFD. Yeah, I, I mean... Yes, the marine highway system is 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 going to bring you some votes. Then you still got the university system hanging out there, and the people that prioritize the university system are going to say, "Wait a second, if you're gonna if you're gonna protect you know everything else, then you need to protect uh, the university system as well." And they've got a fairly solid block, uh, voting block uh, in the legislature. What what this is, and and what you know, so so you you start trying to grab that voting block. You start talking about how you're going to. You know, structure something that, uh, that that solves their solution. At the end of it, you're going to get back to the same place, Michael. At the end of it, you're going to get back to the fact of you need more revenues, and 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 part of this is going to have to be how are you going to provide those substitute revenues? People who <coughs> those who prioritize government spending aren't going to let their aren't going to let the PFD go. They aren't going to let the PFD protected be protected. They aren't going to let their fingers off the ability to cut the PFD to fund government. They aren't going to let the PFD go until they're until they're satisfied that they've got you know, revenue, substitute revenues that they're going to take their place. Uh, that's going to continue to fund government. Yes, buying off the buying off the coastal delegate, the southeast delegations that are concerned about. Uh, about the marine highway system. Yes, that will be helpful. You'll take some additional money out of the ERA, presumably, and set up a trust fund for that. But as I say, then you've got the university. Then you've got the people who are concerned. Then you've got the docs who are concerned about uh, uh, Medicaid funding. Then you've got somebody who's going to be concerned about K through 12. How are we going to fund K through 12? Um, and it's, it's going to continue to go on and on and on uh, in this sausage making. At, at some point, you gotta you gotta straighten up and say we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to solve all these people's concerns by setting up these little small you know individual kitties uh, out of the out of the ERA subdividing the ERA up and setting up these small individual funds. At some point, we're gonna have to address revenues, and that's uh, you know it, it's gonna it, it's it's taken us ten years to get to that realization so far. If if it, it's gonna take us another few months to to you know harden on that realization but that's what's going on everybody's wanting to make sure that they get their revenues at the end of the day there's not enough in the era to set up all the kitties all the funds that would need to be set up to uh uh, to uh, take care of everybody, so you're going to have to address the revenue issue at, at well, some point. And the danger here is, of course, you load this thing up like a Christmas tree, and it just consumes all the oxygen in the room anyway. Um, and you know that it's it's every every special interest project tries to get themselves constitutionally protected, um, and then it just becomes a mess. And and we've lost the whole point of trying to downsize government, which again is the whole point here: downsize and make it live within its means. And if there does need to be new revenue. Make it revenue that uh, that people can agree on, and preferably revenue that can be sunsetted, so that once we do get our fiscal house in order, we're not constantly draining and having that distributional impact problem that you talked about earlier. Yeah, uh, sunset. I mean, sunset would but would 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 hopefully drive the debate at saying, well, you know, when we get to the sunset point, we're not going to be in great shape. 
we're going to have to extend this thing because oil prices are going to be down because production hasn't come on board because you know the 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 continued outstanding performance of the permanent fund hasn't been achieved so so sunset hopefully will drive people saying we're going to have to make these spending cuts uh, over that sunset period if that's what the sunset does great um <coughs> excuse me and so i'm will i'm perfectly willing to give it a chance but uh but it's it, nobody should think we can just drop a sunset and all of a sudden everything's solved and we don't have to do anything else. When you look at the forecast, when you look at where oil prices are going, where you look at what realistic production levels are going to do, uh, when you look at what re is realistic for the permanent fund returns, you, and when you look at where the, sp the spending is going, uh, the current law spending is going, Sunset is just going to be another stopping point in the continuing debate. It's not going to be. It's not going to be the be all and end all. Well, because of course they could always extend the sunset. You know, so I mean, it's 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 not a paper tiger per se, but it's definitely a uh, it's definitely a problem uh, if uh, if they just completely ignore it and utilize it as a way to pass the bill and then just continue to push the sunset date further and further and further away. So, which is. With this legislature and past legislatures, their performance, definitely a possibility. Final 30 seconds here, Brad, your thoughts. Uh, it's important. Everybody should get their comments in on to the comprehensive working group. They're open this week for comments. Either submit you know, oral comments in, at the times indicated or submit uh, written comments. If you feel so moved, focus on the distributional issue because it's just a – it. if we don't know, if we're going to fly blind on who's paying the bill, uh, believe me, the top 20% is going to make make sure it's the middle and lower income Alaska families that pay the bill. So at least raise that issue, uh, if you're of a mind, raise that issue either in your oral comments or your written comments. As we're coming up on the break. Give me a quick tease, Brad, for number two, which is, of course, the discrepancy between what the governor proposed and how we're going to pay for it. Uh, give us the yeah. quick quick synopsis here. We've talked in previous shows about you know my disappointment in the governor for not pro proposing a uh, a revenue uh, uh, option to, you know, make this but make his budget sustainable over the long term. He's kept putting it off. The call of this session, of this coming special session, includes a segment on revenues. He hasn't proposed revenues, and and I just want to focus again on that uh, and show graphically um, um, the gap that the governor's proposals uh, are leaving that have to be filled uh, through revenues, through alternative revenues, or else. Uh, they're going to be filled through uh, continuing PFD cuts. So I think I think it's we we we've had this session on the on the show. People have questioned it. I just want to try it one more time with a graphic to show uh, show what we're doing. We're moving on to number two, which is the revenue gap, the revenue gap of the governor's proposed plan, his absent fiscal policy. Uh, Brad, you've graphified this up. You've made it graphical so people can actually see it. Tell us what we're looking at. So this is for, for people on Facebook who can see it or for people who can later go to the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page to see it. This is a graph that shows uh, the governor's uh, revised 10-year plan adjusted for current uh, futures prices, oil prices, because remember the governor has is basing his plan on accelerated growth in oil prices, which the futures market uh, uh, is not the futures market is thinking that uh, growth is in or the the the, the trend is going to be down in oil prices uh, and it analyzes you know what that what that 10 year fiscal plan is on the left we have uh, traditional revenues the uh, uh, oil royalties uh, production taxes uh, about 500 million dollars in corporate uh, uh, taxes that we collect and, and other fees uh, traditional revenues of 2.28 uh, billion dollars POMV 5050, which is part of the governor's plan, uh, would raise another $1.89 billion. Uh, I've, I've got a subtraction there for $220 million, which is the difference between uh, the governor's proposed, uh, uh, the governor's uh, anticipated uh, uh, revenue from oil. Uh, uh, this is FY26, five years out. Um, the $220 million is subtract subtraction to show uh, uh, the difference between the projected revenues, DOR projected revenues, and what the oil futures market uh, is uh, is currently proposing, and then on the right uh, is the governor's uh, proposed spending level uh, for FY26. Again, I've, I've 
rather than snatch one of the near term years, which are all which are constantly in deficit. This is five years out when the governor has said, you know, we're going to be everything's going to be fine. We're going to have gotten through the rough patch and everything's going to be fine out here. Uh, five years out, uh, his proposed spending level is uh, four point five six billion dollars, which is roughly the same, exactly the same uh, as uh, as the spending level currently. Um, now. <laughs> that that spending level already incorporates about a half a billion dollars in spending cuts. The the Ledge Finances analysis of what spending levels are going to be in 2025, uh, based on current law, uh, paying everything that uh, that's required by current statute. Um, the Ledge Finance uh, uh, estimates the spending at five point. Uh, one billion dollars by at 2025. So the governor's proposal already incorporates about a 550 million dollar spending cut um, uh, below what uh, what current law anticipates. The governor really has not specified where those spending cuts are going to be um, and and how they're going to going to come about. What portions of law are going to be changed to uh, to reduce to, to achieve that 500 million dollars in annual. Uh, spending reductions, but giving you know, given the benefit of the doubt, uh, this chart is based on the governor's uh, 4.56 billion dollar proposed spending level. It shows that even with even with that 500 million dollar in cuts, even assuming um, uh, production growth, this includes the the benefits of, of the production growth that the uh, that the that the Department of Revenue forecast estimates. Even with all of that. We're still six hundred million dollars um, in deficit, and 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 the problem I have with the governor, as I've said on previous shows, and 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 people have challenged the problem I have with the governor is he hasn't proposed one thing uh, that, about how he's going to cl close uh, that uh, that sustainability gap, uh, that fiscal gap um, uh, in the out years. Not only has he not proposed how he's going to close it. In, in 22, 23, 24, he hasn't proposed how he's going to close it in 25 and and uh, and on out. It, it doesn't go away. It right. stays like this uh, through the end of the 10-year period, even assuming those deep spending cuts that are already uh, already baked into the proposal. And I think I think it's just uh, an, uh, a, a a a failure on the governor's part to live up to his responsibilities as governor. Uh, not to not to have something on the table, he said he was going to do it in the call. I mean, he, he put in the call uh, proposed revenue uh, uh, approaches as part of the uh, August special session. There's been some indication that he that the administration has been considering a gambling proposal that would result in some revenues, not anywhere close to closing these gaps, but at least it would be something. But that's not even been put on the table, and I think the governor's failing in his responsibilities. Uh, as the as the chief executive of the state uh, to propose uh, uh, measures which uh, get us to a balanced budget. Let's uh, speculate then. Uh, is this because he doesn't want to be hung with the one that that suggested a tax? Is that he just doesn't want to approach that area, or what? Because obviously cuts are not working. Uh, we need to still push for it, but I mean he doesn't have the fit. He doesn't have the capital or the or the horsepower to pull that together. So is that just it? He's just avoiding it because he doesn't want to be the one that's labeled with proposing a tax. I, I think that's right, Michael. I think that's I think that's he's trying to put. He, he's continually said we're, he's, he will listen to legislative proposals, and I think he's trying to push to the legislature uh, the responsibility to uh, to propose those revenue levels. But two things about that: one, the the legislature is not dumb. There, I mean, they don't want to be the ones to propose it either. Uh, and and there's a lot of uh, uh, back talk about you know if the fact the legislature would do that, the governor would veto it, uh, so he could run on the fact that he vetoed those tax measures uh, in the next election. So I yeah uh, that that's part of it. But but the second piece of that is he ran for governor, and 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 the office of governor has responsibilities whether they're good or bad, whether they're politically beneficial or not. They have responsibilities, and one of those responsibilities is to propose a balanced budget. He hasn't done it. Right. And 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 this continued gap that you can see in any chart you want to do, take his spending cuts, take even take his revenues, uh, take the DOR proposed uh, oil prices, take all of that, you continue to see 
uh, the sustainability gap, fiscal gap uh, over the course of the decade. And it's just I, I, it's just a huge failure on his part. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, and I don't know how to. I mean, I don't know how to get him to move off the dime. And he, he, I can't even get him to come on the program right now to discuss. This. So it's a, it's a little frustrating, for sure, to watch this happen. Uh, and again, especially understanding that the you know size and scope of government continues to creep up a uh, hundred and fifty million a year, uh, regardless of what else happens, and that everything that's been proposed, including the SB fifty seven, where we would take the four hundred and forty million dollars in taxation. For from the North Slope uh, and the pipeline corridor, uh, that doesn't even fill the gap. So there's really there's again there's there's not and nothing has been put together uh, that uh, fully funds the state government, and that's disappointing for sure. But let's move on to number three of our weekly top three, which is um, so, the the North Slope, and then of course Pika that could be in trouble. Yeah, so there's good news and bad news out of the slope, um, and and it's important to keep track of what's going on in the slope because of production levels, and 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 they can't do much about prices, but they certainly can do a lot about production levels on the on the slope. Uh, and there's good news and bad news. The good news is that Hillcorp uh, has filed to essentially restart um, significant drilling activity uh, inside of Prudhoe uh, and the Prudhoe adjacent uh, adjacent fields that. Hillcorp operates that had been shut down effectively as a result of COVID. Conoco, Conoco had restarted drilling, but the partners had not agreed. Uh, essentially, Hillcorp, Exxon, and Conoco all have to agree uh, on on the program for uh, uh, for Prudo, and those and the partners had not agreed to restart drilling uh, in uh, in Prudo at the same time that Conoco did uh, in its fields. Now, uh, Hillcorp has filed plans with the. Uh, uh, Department of, uh, of 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 Resources uh, to with the Oil and Gas Division to uh, to restart drilling, and that's very good news. Prudhoe is a field that an old field that's in decline. You've got to do constant drilling to to keep uh, Prudhoe production levels up, um, and so restarting drilling to to offset the decline uh, in Prudhoe is important. the The bad news on the slope is that the Pika project, which is a huge project that people have really been excited about um, as as adding significant uh, additional supplies on the slope. Uh, that project uh, appears to be in 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 sort of free fall at the moment. Um, the Alaska, when you talk to people in Alaska responsible for the pro or involved in the project, they say, "No, no, we're going ahead." But the Australian press uh, uh, has been reporting. Uh, significant problems with oil search. Uh, oil search is the uh, manager of of the Pika project, um, and those significant problems reported in the oil press, I th uh, in the Australian press, I think are much more realistic than the than the good news stories we're getting out of the Alaska people. Of course, we had the departure of uh, one of the uh, the CEO of Oil Search uh, recently for health issues and also a whistleblower complaint. Um, do you think that this submarines it or are they still because they are still saying that they're going to look at the financial issues and see if it's going to be funded in 2021? 30 seconds here. What are your thoughts? Uh, the Alaska press, the Alaska people say that, but the Australian people would again, oil search is Australian based. The oil search people are saying or the Australian press is saying that they think oil search is, is going to have a real difficulty finding a CEO that is and is enthusiastic about the Alaska project because of the challenges, environmental funding, uh, oil, oil the decline, uh, the, the challenges that face the Alaska project and the Australian press, which is much more important to listen to here, uh, is uh, is much more downcast about it. Well, we'll have to see what happens. It's uh, not necessarily good news for Alaska. We will continue uh, to discuss these things as we go through. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.